You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for January 15th, 2021. It's still not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where both of our congressmen voted to keep a violent fascist demagogue in office in the name of healing and unity. It's the professional left with Drift Class and Blue Gal. Unity, Drift Class. Unity, healing, and unity. Um, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we need to make an announcement. Uh, that this yeah. is this is going to be our last podcast. No, it's not. No, Why no. do you say that? This is going to be our last podcast of the Trump era. Wah, 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 wah. And next time you hear from us, we'll be in the Biden administration. Uh, and everything will be great. Every problem will be fixed. Uh, all, all tears will be dried and so forth. Um, there'll, be no, there'll be no fighting between liberals and democrats and oh, no. everybody will be kumbaya in no, the no, no, no. on the left right well most importantly i think republicans will have learned their lesson <laughs> and we'll have okay. stop we'll stop obstructing et cetera. Et cetera. People, um, get, people got upset with me last week because i laughed in, in the first two minutes of the podcast yeah. and um i wrote to them and i wrote a blog post about it and i realized these are very tough times and everyone's on tenterhooks they really are it's really hard times and they are uh we just warm up our show at the beginning and I leave that in and that's what happens. So, um, and, and, and we wanted to celebrate the win in Georgia last week. We made yeah. a conscious decision that that's what we wanted to do. Uh, the, um, other announcement that we have is that ordinarily this would be our 11th anniversary show. It would, cause it's our 11th anniversary. It, this is the 11th year of this podcast yep. starting you know, we're on, we're on year 12 next week as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided that, you know, doing a retrospective, this, there's such a fire hose of what's going on in the world right now that we're just not going to no. take time for a cake right now. There are other anniversaries coming up this year. There are. Uh, February, middle of February is our the 13th anniversary of me meeting you face to face, Drift That's Glass. True. At That's the, absolutely true. Uh, Shakespeare's sister meetup in Evanston, That's Illinois, next month. Yep. So we could we can do a celebration then, hopefully. Uh -huh. And uh, you and I will have been married ten years. That's true. In August, in August, August nineteenth. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's I an exciting that down, thing. I? I that <laughs> you down. should do something about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know. It's hard to make any plans. We have two graduations in the spring, supposedly. Yep. Junior dude is graduating from college and middle child's graduating from high school. Uh, middle child's actually done with high school. She's finished all her credits and is officially graduated, but the ceremony will be in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just don't know at this point whether there's going to be any such thing so uh well and we have a lot of mottos on this podcast you know we have a lot of things we tell people but the top of the list really from based on feedback is chop wood carry water yeah uh, keep and working it, and it's been that way for us for 11 years and bloggers mm -hmm. uh 16 years for both of us going on 16 yep. years for me mm -hmm. and just as political activists since you know the 80s and 90s so yeah it's. I mean, we have seen the highs and the lows, and the highs and the lows, and the betrayals, and the fuck ups, and the the false hope, and a little bit mm -hmm. of progress, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. it's. We understand. I think from a broad perspective of what we are going through now, and how scary it is, and how there appears to be some light at the end of the tunnel, and how much mm -hmm. work we have to do just to get back to a place where we have don't have Republicans blowing shit up. Uh, we we do understand all that, and we do mm -hmm. think it's important that. We celebrate our victories and we count our blessings and we mm -hmm. be in good mm -hmm. cheer in our community and cheer each other up and, and cheer each other on. And, and Drift Class is very good uh, to do that for me and, and make me giggle when – and at times when maybe on the podcast I shouldn't, but – Hey, uh, I was cracking know. jokes about the color of my father's coffin at the funeral. So, <laughs> oh, no. You know, yeah. It was the Good same Lord. shit brown color as his Delta 88. And we just <laughs> thought that was the funniest <laughs> goddamn thing ever. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. As as, um, as uh, um, Catherine Hepburn says in uh, the, the uh, line in winter, mm -hmm. this is how I register grief or this, yeah. is, how, this yeah. is how I register pain. 
Yeah. Like, it's just a function of of how I cope with this. And a lot of people cope differently. And if the way we cope with things and the way we sort of move through the time that we have with you each week um, is bothersome or, or offensive or, or rub you the wrong way, we're very sorry. Um, we like talking to each other. We get great cheer and joy talking to each other yeah, we about do. terrible things often. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's a function of who – speaking of terrible things um, – well, not terrible. This week, the House of Representatives voted to impeach Donald J. Trump, making him the, the only second time in history to be impeached twice. A man so full of ice, they impeached him twice. Yep. And uh, yep. that is history right there. I mean, he's, he has a, a long legacy of horrible things that will always be true, that will go, that will be on his his epitaph. Um, getting 300,000, going on 400,000 Americans killed through recklessness and and paranoia and conspiracy mongering. But really, uh, impeachment and inciting insurrection are going to be the the top line of his epitaph uh, when he finally shuffles off this mortal, mortal coil and leaves us the fuck alone forever. And speaking uh, of epitaphs, yeah, I I sent. Did I tell you I sent Psalm fifty to Marco Rubio in reply to one of his stupid oh, Bible yeah. verses? I, I, I quoted that on the internet the other day for precisely <laughs> the same reason. A reminder that Psalms, the Bible is not, is not full of joy and light and forgiveness. It is it is equally balanced with these evil fuckers must pay. Oh, God, tear them to bits and throw them into the fire because they're irredeemable awful. So, yeah. Bible bitch. That's not scriptural. Psalm 50. This is verses 16 to 21 in the message translation. Mm hmm. Next, God calls up the wicked. What are you up to, quoting my laws, talking like we are good friends? You never answer the door when I call. You treat my words like garbage. If you find a thief, you make him your buddy. Adulterers are your friends of choice. Your mouth drools filth. Lying is a serious art form with you. I love that. Uh you stab your own brother in the back. Rip off your little sister. I kept a quiet patience while you did these things. You thought I went along with your game. I'm calling you on the carpet now, laying your wickedness out in plain sight. Yep. yep. So when, yep. when Marco Rubio sends, you know, seek my face, O oh Lord. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> you know. That's the last person. I'm you want not to perfect. Serve. I'm just forgiven. Yeah, yeah. Trust me, Marco, there was the a last lot person, of that this week. The last person you want at your door, Marco, is that face. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not coming to forgive you and congratulate you. It's coming no. to take you uh, to the dark place, to the to the fiery place, if you believe in such things. Um, we also want to talk about right up front. Joe Biden has announced his 1.9 trillion dollar recovery package, mm -hmm. um, and and it's this is a news, but it's also something we just want to talk about because. Um, it, it makes, it makes a lot of people whole or it gets a lot of people through and it's, it takes it seriously. This is a serious package proposed to get us over the next hump and on our way to recovery. It, it through March. I mean, I March. think it's really important to understand this is through yeah. March, but it's 400 right. billion for fighting the coronavirus and a trillion dollar direct relief for families, uh, direct payments of 1400 to most Americans and, uh, Four hundred and forty billion aid for communities and businesses, That's, and an extension of unemployment and a four hundred dollar a week yeah. on top of unemployment check, as they were doing, I think six hundred before, um, and and all of this you can fight over it and you can be mad about parts of it mm -hmm. and so forth. It hasn't passed the Congress yet. I suggest if you have strong feelings about one part of it or another. Talk to your congressman. If you have yeah. a Republican congressman, talk to your congressman. Remind yeah. them that their God, Donald Trump, wanted a $2,000 payment to all Americans. Where, how does he feel and, about that now? Well, well, Donald who? Donald who? I, never, I know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wait for it. Uh, there's, there's one way to look at some of these very large proposals. Mm -hmm. I enjoy seeing how the Wall Street Journal has responded. Yes. To yes. To stuff like I don't, this. You don't agree with it, but it's interesting. <laughs> I don't agree with it, respond. but it's right. a lens through which you can figure out mm -hmm. what are the things we really should be fighting for. Because the things that the Wall Street Journal is freaking out the most about are the things you should fight for the most. Yes, exactly. Um, and if you've noticed, the right wing is in 
Fox News and Wall Street Journal and any congressman you talk to on the Republican side, they're all really freaked out about D.C. statehood. Yes, they are. Really, really bad freaked out about it. And so, uh, you know, we may not get that with a 50-50 Senate, I'm just going to say, but let's make that, because they're so freaked out about it, that shows that's an actual threat to their power structure. Yeah. Um, that has to be on the ballot in 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, representing black people, representing a part of the country that has no representation in Congress, no one voting for them, and it is majority black, it's time for D.C. statehood. Well, and you wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit about how everybody's vote should count, right? Right, and everybody's vote should count. And this is, I think, maybe I have talked about this before, but Ainsley Earhart this week, you know, I, it's really about how people feel, you know, yeah. and, and people have feelings. And and Daily Show went and found how she was talking in 2016. Like, why don't Democrats just get over it? Right. It, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, Trump voters have strong feelings and their feelings matter and feelings. And mm -hmm. I thought about it. And really, as I and I have said this on Twitter multiple times, if your state was decidedly one color, red or blue, and it mm -hmm. goes to the other side, it feels like theft. Yeah, sure does. Absolutely, because your vote is erased mm -hmm. by the Electoral College. It is winner take all, except for a couple of states. The Electoral College vote is winner take all. And so this is one reason that Georgia Republicans are really upset because yeah. their state was red and their state was going to send its electors to Washington for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's all Biden going on behalf of Georgia to Washington to vote for Biden. And that feels like, yes, it does. It feels like a theft. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the Electoral College. It should be one person, one vote. It's so easy. It's so easy. <laughs> yeah, just to get rid of that thing. Get rid of that thing. And, and I do believe that that will mollify and moderate the extremes in the Republican Party. Because they'll want to win Republicans and moderate Democrats in states where one person, one vote matters. Mm -hmm. You're going to start fighting for the popular vote mm -hmm. and trying to get your voters to vote for you, not abandoning states like Idaho, where there's reliable Republican, you know, critical mass of voters. You're going to want to get those people motivated to vote for you because everybody has one vote. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I do think I do think that eventually, as things go on, uh, we will still have a two party system. Sure. And it'll be healthy. I think we'll get there. But uh, right now we're in a very unhealthy place. And in, that's in large part due to the red blue map and the Electoral College. So I think that you can explain that calmly and even temperedly to um, a Republican and they would they would nod in agreement. Then they'd look at the bill for it. They look at the tab. They go, "Oh, we lost the popular election every fucking time, go, except mm -hmm. for George W. Bush once." Yeah, this just all you're trying to trick me <laughs> into yeah. ensuring a Democratic majority forever, and which is not the case. No, although that'd that be nice. Is, well, <laughs> and then and then you you listen to uh, our friends on the on the who are to the left of us, honestly, uh -huh. and I respect them. Who will say, "Well, Hillary Clinton is a Republican." Oh, sure. That's fine. <laughs> so, That's fine. You know, their policies are, and there's always the military industrial complex to vote against as well. I mean, sure. who, which party is, there's no, there's no party that in Congress that's against spending for military. So. No, not at all. Anyway. Now uh, let's talk about what people in Congress are in favor of. 95% of Republicans in the House are objectively pro-insurrection. Mm -hmm. We can all agree on that, right? Even our Republican friends can agree that 95% of their party is pro-insurrection because the House represents the, the people. They're the most directly related to their voters. And 95% of them voted to keep Trump in office. So we can conclude from that that most Republicans are in favor of insurrection. Now, the excuses offered by people, including our two congresspersons, uh, vary, tend, seem to vary depending on how secure their seats are. So very secure Republicans who only have a primary challenge from the crazy right to fear, those tend to be the Kathy Griffin and Robert De Niro are the real threats Republicans um, and just can't just can't wrap their heads around the fact that this thing actually happened and they are to blame for it. And we'll never, they'll never accept any blame for it. Well, whereas the less secure Republicans 
like, you know, your Rodney Davises, mm -hmm. seem to blather a lot about unity and healing and how it's important not to hurt the fee the fifis of people who voted for Trump by, you know, holding him personally responsible for the shit he just did. Uh, Rodney Davis voted uh, to certify and, and didn't vote for any of the objections to the certification. Right. Didn't he vote voted for, for the certification. Or Arizona. He, also, he also voted against the impeachment. He did. That's, he did. See, that, that, yeah. And that's... And, and, I, then, I put, and then he went on CNN and said, Donald Trump has been punished for the insurrection. He's not going to be president. Oh, my. Yes, and he Brianna did. And Brianna Kaler went, uh, he wasn't going to be president in November. Yeah. <laughs> Early November was when he was not going to be president. You know, the, the punishment happened then. The insurrection happened last week. Yeah, you, can't, was, you can't reverse the order of that. It was kind of a heroic fountain of double talk and gibberish. Uh, um, and she did say, like, but but. Accountability, <laughs> accountability. Yeah. No, he will not go there. And he and he got and he put on a bravura performance of the kind of sort of indestructible stupidity and denialism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes him beloved of the indestructibly stupid Republicans who live in our community. Well, that's and why that's, they what, that's what uh, my colleague Heather at Kirkson Liars said. You know, God, your congressman is dumb. And I said, he's smart enough. He's got every IQ point he needs to be in Republican leadership in the House. So he's, he does what every Republican around here does when they are cornered. When they are at the diner bitching mm -hmm. about Barack Obama, the Kenyan usurper, they're very open about their racism and their hatred and killery and so forth. But when they're cornered, when they're actually forced to take a vote on a thing that's happened, a bloody thing right in front of them, they pull up, they, they get cow dumb, they get this blank expression on their face, and they start just talking gibberish. And mm -hmm. they start talking in circles. So uh, uh, Rodney told her at the very end of the interview, at the end of the interview, I can make that argument, Brianna, because I've been talking about how that's wrong and it's misinformation, which is gibberish. He he yeah. he doesn't want to hold them accountable. It's uh, as a, a word that comes from the Monty Python universe. It's splunge all over again. Yeah, I sponge. want to be seen as a responsible defender of democracy. I don't want to take any actions to actually do that. I don't want to be held accountable for it. So I'll just talk in circles until the time runs out because the people in my district, the Republicans in my district are just like me. They're dumb. They're angry. They're racist. And they will do whatever the fuck uh, Fox News tells them to do under the pious um, mantle of caring about America, which they absolutely do not. So uh, and, and, he, and he'll get away with it. He got yeah. more votes this time around by 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 a factor of ten than they got mm -hmm. last time. So mm -hmm. let's not pretend that this doesn't work because in Repu and it will go on working. This is what this is what saved them after the Bush administration. This like Bush who I don't know what you're talking about. I'm an independent. Yeah. I would never blah blah. Oh by the way, do you see what Barack Obama just did? He wore a tan suit. Let's talk about that. That will be the strategy for the next four years, which is a shame. But there you go. Um, I did a little back of the envelope calculation just for fun. Um, on the economics of heroism and resistance. And I figured that the uh, MSNBC collectively gives a handful of never Trump Republicans. We're talking about the people you all know, Bill Kristol and Charlie Sykes and Steve Schmidt and those folks, roughly $2.6 million in free publicity every day, every day. That does and the not way he calculates that is by the amount of time they are given on the air Roughly, multiplied yeah. by what a 30 second spot call yeah. costs on MSNBC. 30, uh, yeah. 30 second or 60 second. It's just, it's simple math. You can look up the amounts and it comes to roughly two and a half or a, a little bit higher million dollars, million dollars in free publicity for their cause and their brand every day. This does not include what they get as paid contributors or the knock on value that's a huge boost to them getting book deals and newspaper gigs and speaking engagements and fundraising pitches and subscribers and so forth. This is just the value of the airtime they're given every day uh, as reflected by the ad rates on MSNBC. Now, I put this to you. If MSNBC give me and Blue Gal and our brand two and a half million dollars in free publicity every day, and guaranteed that we would never have any pushback from anyone around us. They'd never challenge us on a thing. Within a month, I guarantee you, I could have their audience believing that Eugene Debs was a robber baron, that the Cubs won the 1988 World Series, and that I was the second coming of Edmund fucking Burke. I guarantee you. So why this huge, ongoing, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year investment in these guys, and not liberals who were actually right all along? And the answer is very simple because it is imperative 
that the diagnosis of our current crisis and holding those people accountable stop at 2016. No further inquiry can be permitted past 2016. Uh, 2016 and 15 continue to be the new year zero. Mm -hmm. And that's how Liz Cheney became the new leader of democracy in America. Isn't that unbelievably offensive that this woman who has blood all over her hands from the Iraq war, she is the reason that Guantanamo is still open. Mm -hmm. And now she's, you know, hero of the resistance. Yeah. And she voted in favor of keeping Donald Trump in office a year ago. Mm-hmm. A year mm-hmm. ago. And the most common battle cry among the same people who are getting two and a half million dollars in free publicity every day from the liberal television network is, I've been warning about this for four years, these past four years, these past few years. You can hear it everywhere. Just like it is I, the razor in the apple to listen for when a when a it truly is. Lincoln Project guy is on the air. Listen for it's always there. Four or five years ago, four years ago, many, et cetera, they years. always mention it. Oh, Tom they Nichols is in USA, in USA Today about bragging about, and these people need to be held accountable. These monsters need to be held accountable. I agree with all of that. As I said four years ago, okay, what about mm-hmm. six years ago? Well, that's, that, that's in the before time. That doesn't count. That would not be true. We would not be pretending that history began in 2016 unless – Television networks pour, pouring tens of millions of dollars into that cause. And you can hear it in every pundit. You can hear it from every never Trumper. And you can hear it from way too many of our allies that let's not worry about all that shit that happened, you know, before then. And that's what's so dangerous because we're about to misdiagnose the problem and mm-hmm. pretend that it all started then. Like I said, Liz Cheney was on the wrong side of history, got up and gave a huge speech about how, uh, how impeaching Donald Trump because Democrats have been trying to unseat him for, since he got here, that good man. And they've been trying to get rid of him for, for since the day he was sworn in. And this is just another example. he was a birther for years before yeah. that. Yeah. But, so, but Democrats. But you can't talk about birtherism, I guess, anymore, right? No, because right? birtherism precedes 2016. And right. uh, therefore, right. it didn't happen or is irrelevant. And so, you know, Democrats trying to impeach this guy for a trivial bullshit reason is actually a threat to the republic. And they should be ashamed mm-hmm. of themselves. And this was a goddamn year ago she was saying this. And Mm -hmm. that is all forgotten. I did a search for that speech, which I remember very vividly, and and came up with page after page after page from the last two days. Mm -hmm. Because (laughs) she's the heroine now. She's the hero of the Republican Republican Party. Yep. And Steve Schmidt on the – today on the Morning Joe show, which is Mm -hmm. now basically the the Lincoln Project happy hour, as is Brian Williams at night – he was talking about how there are two parties in the House. There's the conservative party that, that loves democracy, and that's led by Liz Cheney. And there's the uh, autocratic party that's evil that's led by Kevin McCarthy. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, and the Democrats, no, Democrats don't exist at all. They're not there at all. There's just these two parties that are fighting it out over the future of democracy, and Liz Cheney's the leader of the good guys now. Right, right. And that lie falls apart like a cheap suit in a downpour. The minute you get Move past 2016 and start interrogating the entire history of the Republican Party, which is why Steve Schmidt said five years ago, five years ago, five years ago. ago. Yeah. It's like both sides do it. I challenge you. I challenge you. I challenge our listeners. Listen for it. Listen Listen for for it it every time. Every And and send it to us because the both sides do it thing worked. We challenged both siderism. I've been doing it for 16 years. And everybody's picking up on that. Yeah. Yeah. People are picking up on the five year thing and the four year thing too. Um, Josh Marshall today. Uh, has an article about uh, we have been coddling uh, violent white supremacy for 30 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to read this uh, sentence from him because it's what we've been saying. Um, We can't understand this development, the the insurrection, without understanding, and then he puts in italics, or simply remembering. Uh Because Josh Marshall gets it. The memory is the liberal superpower. Or simply remembering. Mm -hmm. That this is our fourth or fifth round of this cycle. The institutional Republican Party rushing forward to claim that any effort to combat far right terrorism or organized political violence amounts to a crackdown on conservatives or a bias against the GOP. That's right. And we absolutely remember Michelle Malkin and Britt Hume flipping out in. 
2009. The before time. Let's just the before time. The 2009 when the FBI said, there's a problem. White nationalist extremist terrorists are arming themselves. They're organizing. They want to kill Obama. They mm-hmm. want to they want to foment a revolution that puts white people in charge. And it's real. And this report came out and Michelle Malkin lost her goddamn mind and mm-hmm. was on every network talking about that the Obama administration is using this report to silence conservative voices. Cancel culture. It was cancel it's, culture it's, before it yeah. was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I would like Instead to. Instead of saying, oh, my God, there are people who want to assassinate the president of the United States. Maybe something should be done about that. And let's back the blue and support law, law and order. Let's support law and order. No, she didn't say that. She went ballistic and well, said, I, I would, we're trying to silence conservative voices. I, yeah. I'd like to remind um I mentioned this once or twice. The very first blog I ever read, the very first liberal blog I ever read was Talking Points Memo mm-hmm. in 2004. It was, I was directed there by a fellow subversive at the place I used to work at the city of Chicago. Because after the 2004 election, we were devastated. It was how mm-hmm. did this mm-hmm. obviously deranged, incompetent, blood drunk, lunatic administration get reelected? Lied us into just, war and everybody knows it. And yeah. everybody knows it. And he's and he's dumb and he's bad at his job and he's fucking up a lot of things and everything he touches. And a bunch of liberals are getting are getting creamed over this. How would that happen? And a subversive of mine said, there's this thing called blogging. And this guy named Josh Marshall, who has a talking points memo blog. And I went over there and it was like oxygen. It mm-hmm. was like, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. And then I found the Steve Gilliard, the news blog. Right. And then I became a commenter and the rest is history. Although it's not remembered as history because we don't remember it. And the Steve Gilliard kicked you out of his comment section. Go, go blog. Get out of here. <laughs> but here's the point. Josh Marshall's been doing this longer than I have. Right. Right. And, he, right. and, and the reason Josh Marshall is not on panels with Joe Scarborough and Brian Williams <laughs> And so she'll Schmidt bring is. up that pesky 2004 and 2006 and well, 2008 and just, just as you were, just as you said he remembers stuff he remembers yeah. these yeah. things and because he has the temerity to remember the Republican Party actually existed and maybe Rick Wilson was part of the fucking problem maybe he should uh-huh. take some responsibility for that maybe he shouldn't be rewarded for pretending the past never happened maybe Joe Scarborough was part of the problem that's why you will never find someone like that on those shows on those right. panels and if you do. They're wearing a muzzle. There's clearly and that's, that's like a tragedy because the people who were friends with Donald Trump, I know you've got this section in here about Scarborough mm-hmm. always being able to get money for his charity re- fundraising from Donald uh-huh. Trump and being socially engaged with him because yes. of money. And yet everybody knew he was mobbed up and a dangerous guy and not a good guy to work with. But he'd give you two hundred fifty thousand dollars for your charity fundraiser fashion yeah. show, whatever. Um, if Joe Scarborough and those people who really do remember Donald Trump and how he became Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, so-called president, Mm -hmm. uh, they've got an amazing story to tell and they won't tell it because of their culpability and their belief that owning up to it is going to punish them uh, financially, I think, primarily. And that comes from uh, there's an article in The Washington Post today, I think, or yesterday um, from Eric Wempel where Joe Scarborough is on the David Axelrod's Axe Files. But on this podcast, David Axelrod noted that Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski had been friends with Trump, which prompted the question, was he a different person then? And Joe Scarborough talked about coughing up money and stuff, and we knew he was at the same time. He wasn't really a nice guy. But then Joe Scarborough says this, we, note the word we, made the same mistake that, and people hate it when you draw this analogy. I've had, just had to draw it. I think we made the same mistake people made during Hitler's rise. We kind of thought that he was a class clown of New York City. We thought he was a joke. But at the same time, I think you saw what I saw. I I thought he was going to poke the establishment. I never loved the Republican establishment, as you know. And I never really loved the Democratic establishment. I thought he was going to shake some things up. But I never really thought the guy was going to win. And Wemple notes on the last point, Scarborough had plenty of company. All the way up to the evening of November 8th, 2016, the pundit class believed Trump wouldn't capture the Republican presidential nomination, much less the White House. That is the subject of a long post I wrote called The Candidate Who Has Fallen Under the Weight of Her Stone, which is mm-hmm. why the reason so many people from, from Matthew Dowd and, and Ron Fournier 
all the way over to Joe Scarborough and every fucking person in between felt perfectly comfortable shitting on Hillary Clinton and mm-hmm. bashing the crap out of her and run New York Times running article after article on emails, goddamn emails, was that they figured she was just going to win. Mm-hmm. And they believed they were going to look at a Clinton presidency and they wanted to be positioned to be able to tell all their friends on the right, hey, we were tough on her. See how tough we were? See how tough we were? And so they just felt free to just lie about her and make mm-hmm. shit up and, and both sides the shit out of everything. And, and let's be clear, too. They were prepped to delegitimize her presidency and her win because minute. Donald Trump was such an outlier and she didn't really win the election. Donald Trump lost the election because they nominated a clown. Right. And so this wasn't her win. This was his loss. Mm-hmm. And she's not really we, she has zero mandate to govern because she ran against Donald Trump. Well, and, and they and, were prepped for that. And Joe Scarborough and the rest of the never Trumpers had planned. This is when we take the Republican Party back you know, to our side. Right. Because the, the Donald Trump will so destroy the elites and de- de- destroy the people who backed him that we can just walk into the place and run the joint. And that's what, you know, that's what Steve Schmidt was counting on. That's what mm-hmm. Rick Wilson was counting on. And then mm-hmm. when, when Trump won, they found themselves on the wrong side of a wager. Now, they should mm-hmm. have had to pay a really heavy price for that from both sides. Liberals should never have invited these clowns in without a lot of a, a atonement and confession. But no, they said, oh, you're, you hate Donald Trump, too. You're my friend now. Well, mm-hmm. guess what? Your friends, the ones that you gave the moral high ground to, now get to get free $2.5 million of free publicity every day. From what do you MSN, get? From your from liberal MSN television. State. From what MSNBC. Do you get out of the deal? And, right. and, and when, there, when people like us, me mostly, point this shit out, people, my allies, jump on my neck and go, well, you know, the, 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 they're, the, they're the, the enemy of my enemy now. All hands on deck now. We don't want to criticize our allies now. I'm like, don't you understand what you're doing? You're giving away. The most valuable asset liberals have, which is being right about the right all along. If you let people define the past as 2016 forward, you've given away your moral authority to say things like that. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, Mm -hmm. everyone's equal after 2016. Why shouldn't Steve Schmidt be on television as opposed to Josh Marshall? He's he's eloquent. He can talk. And there's 150,000 dead Iraqis to think about, too. I'm sorry, but this this the Iraq war was an immoral war that we were lied into. And I haven't forgotten. And I, people, people, somebody told me I must be fun at parties this week on she Twitter. Is. She is. I can vouch for it. I, you know, I was at, her, at a party in Evanston with her. She's a ball at parties. Uh, but, you know, I haven't forgotten that Home Depot funded Bush's second inaugural. Gee, mm-hmm. you must be fun at parties. Mm-hmm. And she is. No, I'm a, I'm a bitter is. liberal when it comes to that. The insurrection continues to prompt a daily gusher of both siderism. Oh, yeah. Conservative yeah. media continues to warn that holding Donald Trump and his violent goons accountable will only make Donald Trump and his violent goons angrier. And more violent. More violent. We don't want that. So let's just let them go. I, I don't have anything new to add to the fact that both sides do it, other than I think you and I and our listeners and our readers have contributed to making both siderism a joke. People yes. who pull yes. that shit get called out immediately. And I beg you, please, people who, who say the last few years, the last several years, 2015, call them on it. Call mm-hmm. them on it. The same way. And this is also caught on rather more than I thought it would. Even your allies, when they use the word Trumpism, it's not Trumpism. It's Republicans. It's Republicans. It's yep. Republicans. Yep. It's Republicanism. And as I, I, I think I responded to someone today, it's going to be a cute trick to see how 5% of Republicans – throw the other 95% out of their party. You know, yeah. that's not how parties yeah. work. No, you it's guys not. are the fringe. And you guys are the ones, the the elites, the the Republicans who are now never Trumpers, the ones who are making money off of calling Donald Trump names, are the tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the party. And if mm-hmm. it hadn't been their job to tell us what's going on in the GOP for 20 years, I would forgive them for that. I'd say, oh, you're just a bunch of dumb fucks. You're just a bunch of local Republicans here who don't believe anything. Mm-hmm. But this was the expert class. These were the people who were supposed to know what was going on in their party. And they're sitting around with their collective dick in their hand going, I never knew the Republican Party was full of Republicans. Yeah. Well, then why do you have a job at all? Why does anybody well, pay you Well, class – the the question I would have for Steve Schmidt after his discussion this morning on Morning Joe, because yeah. he did have an analysis that there's going to be primary fights in the Republican Party and 
many times the crazy QAnon nut job is going to win that primary. Yes. Because Republican pri- – he didn't say because Republican primary voters are crazy. No. But, but, you know, that's the part he left out. Right. But he said we have to make sure those crazies lose in the general election. And it, as they continue to lose, the Republican Party will moderate itself because they don't like losing. And the question I have for him is yes. – what about the over 200 federal judges that Donald Trump has appointed mm-hmm. who will have some say in whether whether Republican states are able to continue to have voter ID and voter suppression and voter control and putting uh, ballot boxes and only having one in an entire county and so on and so forth? The biggest both sides don't in the world, the one you should always remember is both sides don't engage in voter suppression. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. And Donald Trump got over 200 judges pointed, thanks to Mitch McConnell. And a third of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Oh, Um, yeah. And and it's now a five to four court. mm -hmm. Well, and my question for Steve Schmidt, and I, I was joking with someone today about all the things we would ask if it ever happened, which it never will because we're just the last people in the world who are our panel. With anyone who's who's piping this bullshit into the air, which is, what do you mean we exactly? Yeah, we. we this we business. People sure. in the, in the uh, general election. You mean Democrats, right? You mean the Democratic Party or Democrat Party as it used mm-hmm. to be. Y'all got, <laughs> got religion. And uh, we're happy to defeat the crazies. We would like, in exchange for cleaning up your fucking mess yet again, some consideration when it comes to airtime. Some mm-hmm. acknowledgement that we exist. And it isn't just two parties, the Liz Cheney party and the Kevin McCarthy party. Like <laughs> some knowledge uh, on your part, acknowledgement of some, from, from someone other than Stuart Stevens that the Republican Party predated 2016. And that maybe, just maybe, all the poison Rick Wilson spent his adult life pouring into the groundwater of Republican mm-hmm. politics has something to do with the fact that your base voters are a bunch of lunatic racist assholes. Mm-hmm. Because I don't trust you until you come clean about the shit you stole that I saw you steal. And sitting there and pretending, well, you know, we gave the money back, so why should we have to go to jail, is not not an excuse. Matt <laughs> Dillon would never put up with this shit in Dodge City, and I'm not going to put up with it here. Anyway. We have two letters to read. I am so glad Arliss Bunny wrote me in response to my question about yeah. whether the Iraq war has been paid for. That's oh, I great. Last that's, week. that's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. And she's she's quite the economist. And she, uh, she said, yes, Blue Gal, the Iraq war has been paid for. Every dime the U.S. Treasury has spent since the end of the gold standard has been paid for. Taxes never, ever, ever pay for anything. They can't. The danger in continuing to push the inaccurate pay for meme is that we <laughs> reinforce the agenda of those who put it into play in the first place. In short, pay for is a GOP meme that Dems have accidentally been sucked into. Fight the suck. <laughs> the, US, the U.S. government can afford quality health care for every U.S. resident, as well as enough funding to turn schools into temples and pay teachers like bank executives. We can afford to go after climate change like the existential threat it is. We can afford to protect air and water. We can afford to help small business survive the Trump depression. All of it. The only thing that should be allowed to put the brakes on the economy is inflation that exceeds 5%. And even that is arguable. The Federal Reserve keyboards, their computer systems, create into existence every dollar authorized by Congress, always. Think Mm -hmm. about the trillions spent rescuing banks. The Fed cannot run out of keystrokes. (laughs) That's very interesting. That's true. um, The... I had a girlfriend uh, back when I lived in Alabama who worked for a bank and her job was so it, it was something that they never advertise on their website or folders or brochures or anything. She was in charge of the computer system that when you um, cash a check or mail in a check to the electric company, the money comes out of your account and it goes to the electric company. And for a fraction of a second, that money belongs to the bank. Yes. And her computer systems helped the bank earn interest on that money for that half a second. Mm-hmm. And that's millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Every time anybody writes a check, the bank earns interest on that money for that fraction of a second. 
I mean, it's it's absolutely absurd that that happens. That don't get me started about how PayPal holds onto your money for a day until you get it. <laughs> you know, that's uh-huh. that's completely different. But but again, people are earning interest on money that they're holding while it's being transferred. And that's that's a scam in my in my book. Um, uh, Arliss Bunny completes her uh, letter with, by saying one of the biggest reasons Democrats can't have nice things is because we have allowed them to brainwash us. Mm-hmm. For deprogramming, I recommend The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. You and Driftglass remain ever in my heart. Many carrots, Arliss Bunny. Oh. All right. Yeah. And then we got a letter from Jay. And uh, this has to go back to the both sides don't thing because there's very good both sides don't uh, from Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney. He, he had a big thing about both sides don't this week. He did. And, uh, you know, why are why are corporations turning off uh, money for both Democrats and Republicans? What did we do wrong? That's a good question. And uh, he, he was right on that. Um, and then uh, Mehdi Hassan on Peacock also called out the poor corporate press mm-hmm. uh, at length about mm-hmm. this is our fault. A lot of this is our fault by pretending that the parties are equally bad. Yes, they are. Yes, they did. And. Uh, so we got this article from Jay about Mehdi Hassan uh, calling out the corporate press. I saw your article at Crooks and Liars the other day recapping Mehdi Hassan righteously calling out the corporate press. And it reminded me that I wanted to ask if you or Drift Glass had any thoughts on Peacock's news channel. It seems like NBC is testing the waters on creating a progressive 24-hour news channel or something similar to it. Right now, it's three primetime shows that play on a loop all night with boilerplate NBC news coverage during the day. But those three shows are pretty much everything I'd want out of progressive leaning news, despite my general wariness toward corporate media. You've got a black woman, a brown Muslim man and a Jewish guy. None of them are afraid to call out the Republican Party's malfeasance without without the both sides bullshit. They call racism and lies what they are and treat socialism as a valid economic philosophy, highly compatible with democracy instead of some Cold War era tribal identity. I originally, I originally signed up for Peacock to check out Mehdi Hassan's show, since I've always appreciated his ability to put the screws to dodgy guests who make the questionable choice to allow themselves to be the subject of his interviews. Yeah. But since checking out the rest, I've been wondering if this might not be NBC taking the temperature and realizing that the outlook is grim for major new cable news networks as audiences who want to watch Bush regime dead enders on their liberal TV age out. Hell, even the right-wing nutjobs seem tired of that crowd on their conservative TV as they're ready to cross the rainbow bridge to OANN Valhalla. Well, yeah. It's clear not just by the politics of Peacock's hosts, but also by how hard they're pushing their Saved by the Bell reboot during this block, that they're pushing hard to appeal to my cohort of first-wave millennials. I'm assuming that's also the group most likely to be cord cutters in the market for such programming. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if they're staking out this niche out of necessity or if it's a sign of where NBC thinks things are heading. It certainly hope it's a I certainly hope it's a case of corporations trying to win the future. But I also know big media will never be my friend. So I'm cautious. Either way, it's nice to be pandered to once in a while. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for all your excellent work and giving me the time, Jay. And I would say that the suits upstairs are happy to pander to every niche in the book yeah that would be and putting it on peacock where the cord cutters are anyway is a logical thing to do yeah well and Um, and it's about money the reason Mm -hmm. we have peacock is i wanted to watch the rockford files so that's why we have (laughs) peacock um see see drift class just aged himself i did and and happily actually i wanted to watch ap bio yeah so there we get we get it with our cable anyway i mean it's free free with our cable so Um, but what what I always bring to the, the table is this thought is that people who run media corporations do not look at the, as the news as news. They look at it as a form of entertainment and product. Yep. And they don't look at, yep. uh, at the people who watch those things as citizens or, or um, news consumers. They look at them as customers. Yep. That's why there's always this hunger from the larger network blobs like NBC, ABC, CBS, and uh, as CNN, et cetera. To find some way to get at those millions and millions of meatheads who watch Fox News. Right. That's why you have a Rick Santorum on CNN. That's why you have 
the the closest you can come is the both sides do it, both sides do it, both sides are bad, both sides are awful, which is the la- final excuse of every conservative I've ever known. Um, it makes it safe ish for those people to watch the entertainment program and buy dick pills and reverse mortgages. That's all they care about. Mm-hmm. And if you look at television generally, they're throwing money at everything. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just throwing money at everything. I mean, there's there's a prequel coming for the for the Lord of the Rings, and there's going to be a Game of Thrones thing, and uh, there's going to be like 19 different Marvel TV shows, which are all fine with me. But it reflects an industry that is has so much money and so much mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. hype to fill that they're willing to fund anything, even at the end of your dial, a tiny, tiny niche of liberal programming that is right. explicitly liberal because they know that there's going to be 20 people out there who will watch it. And what the fuck? It doesn't matter. It doesn't cost them anything. So why not go after those 20 people who will be happy uh, that their opinions are being reflected? But it doesn't matter. It's just another box of cereal in the cereal aisle. And they yeah. own the cereal company so they can rebrand boxes any way they want. But it's all the same. It's just product to them. They don't care well, about and, the content. And that's, and that's what uh, Parler is too. I mean, yeah. now that Parler is gone and off the Amazon server, mm-hmm. we're, we're hearing uh, Dan Bongino talk about his investment, which by the way is illegal because they never – listed themselves as an investment or taking on investors or having right. any contract for investors. So he basically admitted to breaking the law on, t- on national TV. But um, think about, think about <laughs> what it was my investment. I haven't slept all weekend. That was my investment in Parler to, that's now gone away. It's like. Uh, think about what Quibi could have done if they just waited <laughs> another couple of months and, and become were, Parler. And, and, a, and a $2 billion flushed down the toilet. Right. You know, just flushed down the toilet. Hey, let's do a news roundup. Hey, let's do that. After dangling his turtle toes in the impeachment sounds fine to me, Waters, after the House impeached Donald Trump, soon to be Senate minority leader, I love the sound of that, minority leader, minority leader Mitch McConnell, immediately rejected calls to bring the Senate back for an emergency session to begin Trump's impeachment trial. They can't do it before January 19th, strict class. It's impossible. It can't be done. There's, there's, it just, the universe folds over between now and the 20th. There's just literally no time. Unless anymore. there's a Supreme Court seat that needs oh, to yeah. be filled. Then, you, you know, know they, they can do that. We'll they, come I in agree. on Sunday for that. Yeah. Well, I think there used to be a thing where they would literally stop the clock in the Senate and they just keep talking until they decided to stop. And then they started again. So I guess we, I guess we don't do, do that for impeachment. Um, Yesterday, bad day in the United States, very bad. Um, the United States reported more than 4,200 COVID-19 deaths. That is a single-day record, a very grim single-day record. Via the Washington Post, uh, total fail on the far part of the Trump administration regarding vaccines. Mm-hmm. And lie. Vac- a lie. And lying. Yep. The vaccine reserve was already exhausted when the Trump administration vowed to release it. It was already gone. This dashes hopes of expanded access. Now health officials across the country who had anticipated their extremely limited vaccine supply as much as doubling beginning next week are confronting the reality that their allocations will not immediately increase. Dashing hopes of dramatically expanding eligibility for millions of elderly people and those with high risk medical conditions. Health officials in some cities and states were informed in recent days about the reality of the situation while others are still in the dark. They just lie. They just lie all yeah. the time. This is the same lie being told, you know, that was told at the beginning. Remember, we were going to have a brand new healthcare system the day Donald Trump took office. And it was day one. Awesome, a great yeah. day one. And then it was going to be two weeks. Then it was going to be some period of time. They started off just telling lethal, dangerous, deadly lies and have spent four years doing nothing but that and are leaving under a cloud of telling even more lethal, deranged lies because they don't give a shit. This doesn't affect them. This this is no way affects them or their circle, so they just don't give a damn. Two days before the Republican insurrection at the Capitol, the FBI warned that extremists were traveling to Washington to commit violence and quote-unquote war. Fox News' Mike Huckabee called impeachment a lynching of Donald Trump. And you know what's coming next, because Hugh Hewitt has gone back to being deeply apocalyptic about the national debt. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to... Throw some Arliss Bunny here his way uh, on that deficit bullshit. Okay. Rudy Giuliani found out this week that he's working pro bono for Donald Trump. Oh, no. <laughs> Trump is reportedly demanding that he personally approve any reimbursements for the expenses Giuliani incurred while traveling on his behalf to challenge election results. 
Welcome to Tip Jar Land, Rudy. Also, Rudy was mentioned on, I don't know which social media platform Sydney has found herself on, the other Trump lawyer. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she's now tweeting that someone needs to look into Rudy's ties to Venezuela and Dominion. Old friend, now, of, old friend of Hugo Chavez, Rudy. Old friend, dead yeah, Hugo Chavez yeah. over here like this. Yeah, and and Sidney Powell is is now you know publishing on social media attacks on Rudy Giuliani that he's in on the conspiracy. Hmm. Well, you he's can not only... going to get paid, and he's in on the conspiracy. Maybe he'll be a never Trumper in two weeks, Drift Glass. It, two weeks. You can only you got to figure you can only be sued for one point three billion dollars once, you know, and then <laughs> you have nothing left. Um, and speaking of people we should never, ever hear from again, Jim Comey, remember him? He insists that Biden should consider pardoning Trump for the good of the country, which is why Jim Comey should shut up and go away forever. Fun facts about the newly sworn in lunatic Republican Lauren Boebert. She did not graduate from high school. She got her GED. And we are very pro GED here at the Professional Life Podcast. We Absolutely. believe in education. We do. Uh, but Boebert got her GED five months before she was elected to Congress. Yeah. Think about that. Probably skimped on the Constitution part is what I'm guessing. <laughs> well, government class, yeah. yeah. Um, she has been arrested four times. She was a court no-show once because she backs the blue and is law and order, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, her husband was arrested for exposing himself to two minors. Oopsie. And uh, January 4th, she posted a video of herself carrying a gun, but she has no Washington, D.C. gun permit. Mm -hmm. That's a serious crime. It is. And it's not just the capital you can't carry. You can't have a gun in D.C. without a permit. Mm. And once I'm sure I'm sure the Capitol Police will explain that to her as they escort her out of the building. If she tries to pull any shit like that ever Mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rex Tillerson. Remember him? Uh, He finally noticed that Trump's foreign policy was was excuse me, was a disaster, but somehow forgot to mention that he was a big part of that disaster. After pleading not guilty to murder earlier this month, Kyle Rittenhouse showed up at a Wisconsin bar wearing a T-shirt that said free as fuck. Then the 18-year-old drank beer, posed for photos with members of the Proud Boys, and flashed a white power sign. Oh, Jesus. Is is Sidney Powell his attorney? Uh, I think Rudy Giuliani is, because he's going to be looking for work. He's going to be looking for some some (laughs) of that contingency money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Speaking Uh, of people who have jobs they should never, ever have... Uh, ben Shapiro's got a new get, get political, but this is from your TV husband. So why don't you go ahead and take this one? Yeah, Ellie Mistel's comment speaks for all of us. Mm-hmm. You can't make this up, Ben Shapiro's new gig at Politico. Politico's official defense for promoting white supremacy is, quote, mischief making, unquote. This is how too many white people think that allowing white supremacists to tout their views is just impish. And now some good news. After a long wait, a 36-year wait, Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League is a real thing. Not a movie, but a comic book. And I, for one, have been waiting six times six years for this thing to show up on my doorstep. Because Perfect Tommy, I got to know what happened to him. You got to know what happened to Perfect Tommy. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because he's perfect. Because he's perfect. All right. I, I am looking forward to that comic book. That'll be fun. Donald Trump has repeatedly spoken by phone with Steve Bannon in week, recent weeks to seek advice on his campaign to overturn his reelection defeat, reconciling with his once estranged ex White House strategist. This is like a Telemundo novella. It really you know? is with horrible, horrible people. <laughs> and on his Fox News show, Tucker Carlson attacked Alexandria Ocasio Cortez as a vacuous little totalitarian. Really? Yeah, really. And reminder, this is the same Tucker Carlson who went ballistic and said he feared for his family's safety when a handful of people briefly showed up on the sidewalk outside his house with a tambourine. Mm -hmm. Uh, It has been a week since Donald Trump was effectively banished from pretty much every social media platform, which is now pretty much all they talk about on Fox News. Yeah, the social media shutdown, not people dying of COVID. It's big tech, cancel culture, liberal mobs. Uh, instructed not to use any of the half dozen bathrooms inside the couple's house. The Secret Service detail assigned to President Trump's daughter and son-in-law spent months searching for a reliable restroom to use on the job. They have six bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, According to neighbors and law enforcement officials, 
After resorting to a porta potty as well as bathrooms at the nearby home of former President Barack Obama and the not so nearby residence of Vice President Pence, the agents finally found a toilet to call their own. This came at a cost to U.S. taxpayers. Since September 2017, the federal government has been spending $3,000 a month, more than $100,000 to date, to rent a basement studio with a bathroom from a neighbor of the Kushner family. This is, you know, bad. First of all, I want to hear what Hugh Hewitt thinks of taxpayer money being spent that way because the deficit, you know. You know, the deficit. Um, but I also, uh, this is this is the tip of the iceberg. Everything you're hearing now is not the worst you're going to hear about the Trump oh, family. No, 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 no. Just, just wait. And all of a sudden it's going to be, oh, no, we're the coffee filter party now. We don't know anything about Trump. I never liked the tweeting. I'm an independent constitutional conservative. You know, uh, what, I, you know what I predict? <laughs> I just predict this. Yeah. My mom, the the late great mom, um, mm-hmm. when my brother and I were teenagers, uh, and we both got into some mischief, uh, she brought us both out, and she stood us, sat us down side by side, and told me that my brother had ratted me out for something. Mm-hmm. I said, "Oh yeah, you think that's bad?" And I ratted him out, and then he ratted <laughs> me out, and, I ratted him. and she just sat there taking notes, going, "Really, really, this is like okay, you'll be grounded for five years, and you'll be grounded for the rest of your damn life." It's mm-hmm. a brilliant strategy, and I believe coming up in the next couple of months, if not over the next year, when everyone's writing a book, it's going to be, oh, you think that's bad? Let me tell mm-hmm. you about the, the bodies they bury in the basement of the White House. It's going to be yeah. horrendous, and it's going to be constant, and there are going to be people trying to make money off of it. Um, here's some good news. Because they're craving people who want to make money yeah. off of it. Yeah. Who, who were there? The reason they know this is they were at the scene of the crime holding the lantern as as Trump buried the bodies. That's mm-hmm. why they're able to talk about this stuff. Um, There's some genuinely good news happening out there in the world. The National Rifle Association has filed for bankruptcy today. Bye-bye, National Rifle Association. Uh, We have some good news locally. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is going to be a shuttered venue grant, uh, also known as Save Our Stages, to help the performing arts industry in the state of Illinois, and I guess nationwide. So uh, I'm glad about that. The city health department in Springfield announced that Springfield is going back to phase two next week, which means uh, restaurants can open with indoor dining of 25 percent uh, and uh, bars cannot reopen yet. Um, restaurant owners will be asked to keep track of who is in the place and question whether patrons have been exposed to COVID. Uh, that's going to be very tricky. Um, if you are a local restaurant in Springfield, your 2020 restaurant permit fee will be rebated 50%. That's really great news for a lot of restaurants. Uh, we live in Illinois' capital city, by the way, folks. And uh, Drift Glass was on a Zoom call where one of our aldermen was present. Yes. And, and she said that there are credible threats to the Capitol. We have two Capitol buildings, the old Capitol building and the quote unquote new Capitol building, which is where the legislature meets, and both of them are have been threatened. Uh, the old Capitol building is where Barack Obama announced his uh, presidential candidacy in 2007 mm-hmm. uh, or January of 2008, and um, that's also where Barack Obama introduced Joe Biden as his running mate. So mm-hmm. there are connections to Biden right here in Springfield. Uh, it's scary how close we are to what is a credible threat of violence. And um, the, I'm sure the downtown will be shut down uh, over the course of the next uh, week. And uh, we're, we're thinking about the people that have to protect that area. Yes. And the people that have to live there, who right. live downtown, who work downtown, who have businesses downtown, who this mob of you know Republican violent lunatics just making threats is sufficient to put us all on our guard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, One more bit of good news. Mike Madigan is no longer Speaker of the House in the state of Illinois. He is still uh, holds office, but the corrupt Speaker of the House, Democrat, who is a corrupt Speaker of the House, been a Speaker for 900 years, Mm -hmm. uh, and who was hung around the neck like an albatross around everyone running for office in the state who's a Democrat. Everybody who ran for anything was one of Madigan's cronies. In particularly um, house house races, absolutely the, the the Republican House Congressional Caucus people knew that just doing anti Madigan ads mm-hmm. all season it, it worked. Yeah, it worked because uh, he is corrupt, and 
everybody knows it. And the governor wanted him out and lots of Democrats in the state house wanted him out. And he was finally convinced, OK, I'll step down. And and it was sort of a threatening thing of I'll step down and see if you can elect anybody else. Well, they elected Ooh. someone else. <laughs> And uh, they elected Chris Welch, who, uh, congratulations to Chris Welch. Mm -hmm. He is the first black house speaker in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is a very good thing. And we're grateful and and welcome him uh, and his caucus, the black caucus in in Springfield Mm -hmm. at the state house is doing great things. So uh, glad to have him on board. And thank all of you for listening for 11 years. Those of you who've been with us since the beginning, we appreciate it. And we promise to have a more anniversary style show, uh, hopefully sometime later in the year. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website, an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Ringer. Ringer belongs to our angel nerd and website manager, Tammy. And uh, Ringer is a political animal. He is a proud Texas Democrat, and we love him. Uh, Ringer eats... Freshly Poured Cat Food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Ringer at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write to us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details, our PayPal postal address information, all of it, including Both Sides Don't Merch, which is going to be big this year. Huge this year. It's all there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, just in time for the inauguration, the Internet Kitties are introducing a line of 3D inauguration glasses for... You won't be able to see anything. You won't see stuff in 3D. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.